So agile might seem a little bit abstract. So there are a different couple of different ways in which you can actually go about performing this or acting out this agile manifesto. And there were two different methods that we covered. The first method is extreme programming, which actually sounds a little bit more exciting than what it actually is. But it is the application of agile principles to a working methodology. And this kind of puts the basic principles of extreme programming into context. So the customer is in the team, first and foremost. And what you do instead of gathering a list of requirements, you generate these things called user stories. So these are statements which have enough detail to show how a customer actually wants to use a product. And through doing these user stories, you can develop requirements. And it avoids a lot of detail, seeing as the requirements are most likely to change. The most common way of capturing user stories is on post-it notes. So saying client one wishes to use the database to input data about company holiday, holiday um, dates, you know, something like that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff out there on user stories. And again, this user story becomes a bit of a token. Once the user story has been satisfied in the development, then that part of the project is ticked off and you, you go closer to having your completed working software. So um, as, a, as a moderator, of a website for her, perhaps you want to say I want to add comments to my website so that um, the website becomes interactive that is an example of a user story again there are loads of examples out there and by having these story statements you then can write your tests you say okay so um, does the comment system function in the manner specified and you specify the manner and then you simply tick this off once it's been achieved. So once this has been developed you've done your tests and you've satisfied your requirements and you don't pass the tests and they're not signed off until they are 100% um, test compliant. This is just a different way of unit testing. Extreme programming again really emphasizes that you um, make your design and your implementation as simple as possible. The way in which it works is that you do the simplest thing that is that could possibly work and then you make it elegant or optimal later. So you make um, a function which you could do in sev several different ways. You could use a linked list class to store some data or you could just use an array. In extreme programming you probably just use an array to start with to get the functionality actually working. So you don't build a giant, super efficient object, sorted, hash, linked together, if an array will just do. You make do with what will just simply do. This makes it much easier to test. This much produces code which is much more understandable. And later, if you want to add this extra functionality, once everything else has been put in place, then you can then go through and refactor your code. Something that probably sets extreme programming and agile apart from the other development methodologies is that it explicitly states that you work in pairs. Now, in a commercial setting, this is something that we couldn't do in our lab. You often have two keyboards and two, two um, mice set up um, for each terminal. So both people are actually developing a piece of software at the same time. So one member or alternatively one member drives which is using the keyboard and mouse to develop while the other one writes test cases as the code is being developed and spots any kind of um, errors or bugs or makes improvements along the way and it isn't just it isn't very it isn't a static process that one person sits and writes all the code and one person sits and writes all the tests you swap every half an hour so that both of those people know exactly how that code works this is really useful in case somebody leaves the company in case somebody's ill somebody gets stranded in uh, somebody gets stranded in the US because the volcano in Iceland has gone off again and they can't come into work and this also facilitates the distribution of knowledge about the state of the code and about the function of the code throughout an entire team. 
and when Agile is used commercially, the pairs are swapped either every half day or every day. So lots of different people have lots of different knowledge about lots of different parts of the code. This is why, relating back to an earlier point, why you need to adopt good coding standards and consistent coding standards when working within a team. So even though you've got two people working on the same bit of code, it doesn't degrade the efficiency of the team. It increases the productivity because two heads are better than one and because the tests are written at the same time as the code and also the amount of errors produced is minimised. Fixing errors downstream can be really costly, again for the same reason as to why fixing requirements downstream can be costly, is that you have to go through several stages of implementation and testing again if you find it at the integration stage. So if you find the bugs early because you're working with other people, then this is highly beneficial. So it's been shown statistically to reduce the defect rate in products. So and also it can avoid some version control issues as well and then neither one of you has done all of the coding on all of the writing this is what I was hoping that the majority of people would do for their coursework and I'm really pleased to say that a significant proportion of you did this finally there's test driven development I wasn't convinced when I first heard about this as a programming paradigm but since actually delivering this course and speaking to people in industry who use it, I see the advantage of it. All production code is written um, from a series of tests that must be passed. So before you write any of your code, you write down all of your tests and then you run your tests. But because you've not actually implemented anything, all of your tests fail. And then as you implement features, you can tick off your tests which have passed. So the iteration between writing tests and actually writing the code is very short, often minutes. And as a result, you test every single function, line of code or variable that you add to see whether it complies with the tests that you've written or not. And it's not that testing is developed after the fact. It's highly integral to the process. In fact, it kicks the process off. You have lightweight documentation. You, you don't need to write everything down because the tests should explain exactly what the functionality of the code is. And you keep this documentation to a minimum. So test-driven development relies on a process called red-green refactor. First up, you write your test to which you know your code is going to fail. This means that your code is at the stage red. Then you keep adding lines of code and every line you add, you retest it. This means that once the tests are passed, the code turns green. And once you've gotten to the green stage, you then refactor the code, which means if you, if you feel like um, it's too simplistic or it's too ugly, then you can modify it to be more readable, more optimal. This is a process called refactoring. And once you've refactored, yep, you guessed it, you've got to run all your tests again. So there are so many tests in test-driven development. This is where... Um, commercial test harnesses come into their own and are really, really useful. So, if extreme programming and agile methods are so good, why isn't everybody doing it? Well, the truth is, now that we've got far fewer people in development teams, everybody is doing it to some degree or other. Even the monolithic companies, even the big corporations like Microsoft and Experian, and Capital One, when they develop their software, they are now using agile, um, agile processes. It cuts down on overhead and produces higher quality software. And also, I think one of the most important things is that we now live in an on-demand culture. We don't want to have to wait six months to see our product. We want to have week. We want to have either weekly updates or daily updates on how our product is progressing, and we want to keep an eye on these things because we want better bang for our buck. So the, because the customers are involved, they get this on-demand satisfaction and are much more likely to pay you uh, for both this product and for future products as well. So that's pretty much uh, a roundup of the methodologies. In summary, don't forget their terms, waterfalls, spirals, V models, agile, extreme programming and test-driven development. Uh, coming up in part three is just um, a brief summary of the necessary project management stuff that you need to know.